Welcome to Politics Welcome. Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you. Good morning, Houston and everybody else. Good morning, Southeast Texas. Good morning, Texas. Good morning, the rest of the world. How's everybody doing today? It's a great thing. You know, this morning we started out, you know, uh, talking about, uh, first of all, you know, we had a great Great opening of the, the our new building. Of course, we've been open for a while, but we just inaugurated the building. It was great seeing all the great guys out there. It was great uh, hanging out with Howard as Howard was getting things working out there like no other. And of, of course, uh, hanging out with Van Beber again, Jack Van Beber. Good morning, my brothers and my sister, or just my brothers in the in the uh, control room this morning. How you doing this morning? Yeah, Jack left his tutu at home, so he's a brother today. I'll be a girl today. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we have Monday Madness going on here. I yeah, we do have Monday Madness because you know we have that that comeback kind of speaker, all that good stuff working. Anyhow, folks, we have a great show, Howard. But you know, before we were talking about if you're coming in on fifty nine and six ten going into town, we're talking about the homeless out there and it. Uh, because be, because Van Weber brought it up, I just want to make a mention about it. Many of us sit down there thinking that uh, ah, the you know we just discard the homeless as if these are people that deserve it or these are the unworthy, these are the people that aren't working, etc. I want to I want to tell us we need to we need to start having a, a bit of compassion. You never know. I've spoken to some of these folks out there. You never know when that could be you. And many people think it can't. You take a, take a look at what's happening to rents, etc. Uh, right now. You take a look at what it's costing to repair a car right now. You take a look at all the different things where our economic system is just making it very difficult for people, right? Because again, those on the top, they just have to they progressively have to take more, take more, take more. And when they're taking the bigger part of the pie, remember that bigger part of the pie come out of you. And the part of you that it takes are, first of all, it handles those who can least afford it. I have a metaphor that I used to use a long time ago, right? Uh, and, it, and it went like this. And, and it's sort of a, even though I try my best many a times not to be racial, sometimes I have to bring it up in the co context of how it is used. At one time, right, it, it, because there is a minority of BIPOCs, people of color in the country or whatever, uh, things could happen to those people. But because the majority of the population realize, well, that ain't me and that's not me and it may be, maybe that those are things that can't happen to me. But as a plutocracy, and by the way, uh, the only reason we have divisions in this country is because the plutocracy needs division in this country to exist. Those who control our economic system needs division in this country. People are not inherently divisional on, in the manner in which we have it. Yes, there are some anthropologists that will tell you, uh, well, you know, people kind of, if, if there are folks that, that's been around and look a certain way, that's a tribe and they, they, they feel other tribes. Well, look, in America, we've been together long enough that those things don't, those things don't really exist intrinsically. Now, what has happened is society was created in a particular way to say, well, those things can't happen to me. But an economic system that continuously depends on abusing and abusing and abusing to succeed. In other words, a particular sect getting more. Eventually, you run out of people that you can abuse in the aggregate. I'm saying in the aggregate now. This is not on an individual basis. This is on the in the aggregate. Eventually, you run out of people that you can take advantage of. And you have to slowly start gobbling the rest of the population up. I was watching, uh, watching the news this morning with um, uh, Morning Joe. And, and there's a 44% uh, constancy about the people who support Donald Trump and the policies that, and, and the kind, not the policies that Trump support, but the policies they believe Trump support, which is not anti everybody else and for them. And, and Michael Steele was trying to explain why are these people locked on to him? And I think he gave a poor explanation. The explanation, I think, I know it. And what I mean by I know it is, there is a group of folks that are aggrieved and 
It's the plutocracy. It's our economic system that are, that's aggrieving these folks. It's the ones that are harming these folks. But they cannot believe that. And what Trump is out there doing is Trump is saying, hey, guys, it's those other people that are harming you. But these are, but it's not true, right? The system just has taken all it could from those it could already abuse easily. And you know who is the next, the next cat on the list to be abused? You are. And as long as we can keep your eyes off the ball, as long as we can have you believe in that those other people are your problem as opposed to what the real problem is, then you can support uh, you can support a charlatan who's out there telling you, hey, you know why I think you know why the prices are going up? You know why is this? And they are focused on that. And I mean, I was surprised, as you've heard on many of my shows before, that Donald Trump could have gotten 74 million votes in an America that is supposed to be intelligent. Well, it's not that America is dumb. It's just that America is scared. But anyhow, off my soapbox, it's just that um, Van Beber got me started with this message with a homeless person that was outside of our studio yesterday. Anyway, good morning. Good morning to everybody. And brother Jack Van Beber, the morning message. Uh, I've been thinking about something and it, and it's, you know, what, what is the purpose of dissent in the political process is what I've been thinking about because, you know, we got some stuff coming up looming on the horizon when people start protesting and there's automatic weapons out there in the crowds. And I see this as a real big red flag danger. You know, it's already, uh, you know, crushing dissent with this open carry policy. Yes. And uh, th this was my this was my worry of the day. Basically. Well, I, I tell you about your worry of the day, my brother. It's a, it's interesting that I was talking to a, a good friend of mine. I was at Starbucks writing some blogs yesterday, and my good friend El Señor Carrillo came in and started uh, talking. He's originally uh, from Cuba, and we were talking about what was going on. And I think we all came to the same conclusion. I don't think there's a sect in this country that things are look things. The economic system right now for quite a few people is fairly good, right? But there's there's another set of people that are that are on on the fence right now and we are of the belief that all this arming of america and the uh, and the the kind of dissension that occur that uh, conflict that can occur in in two, 2024 i don't think those on some on the right uh, and many of our plutocracy would mind too much if things really get out of hand that we have to become more of a authoritarian sort of a deal Okay, and we were going through the machinations. It's not, not the show today, so I won't go into detail about some of the stuff that we spoke about. But I think the brother was absolutely right. You know, I think we're at the stage now, you know, Dr. Richard Wolf, economist, would tell you that we are at end stage capitalism right now, where it's re reaching the stage that we all who know a little bit of math knew that it was going to be getting to because of the ir irregular irregularity, not the irregular, the, the inconsistency of how the wealth grows on up, up at the top and how it disappears down at the bottom. It, it is not, it is, a, it's not a feature. It's what, it's what the economic, it is what, what, what should I say? It is a formula that defines the economic system and too few. And again, especially now that we don't want people to do critical thinking or we don't want people learning or we don't want people doing that. Jack, we have a lot of teaching to do and the work that we do here, uh, as little as we are, uh, the work that we do here, all of us, it is so important. It is so important. Anyway, you want to add anything to that, Howard? Well, you know, we're in the second Gilded Age. This happened at the turn of the century. Yes. And one of the things that uh, the government put in place was the Sherman Antitrust Act. Yes. And now they just, if they just enforce the laws, the, the commerce laws, which we have, the Federal Trade Commission, if they enforced the antitrust laws, if they enforced what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't be in this position. It started Very under Reagan. It started under Reagan not enforcing those laws. He says, "Oh no, we 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 really don't need those laws. This will 
uh, this will magically work itself out. Well, it doesn't, and it and it won't. The antitrust laws were put in place to stop what's happening now. When they were first in, put in place and enforced, well, we didn't have these mega, mega, gigantic companies owning everything and everybody. You know, and what Howard did do is go back to the enforcing of antitrust laws, breaking up some of these huge companies. You know, because that's what it is. And Howard, I want to interject one thing there. There's another thing as well, my brother. And it went like uh, after you make X, after your income of a certain level, meaning not your basic income uh, that, you know, a few millions or whatever, but after a certain amount, you had a 90 percent uh, tax rate on people. A 90 percent. No, what that did is it corrected the flaw in capitalism that allowed eternal growth for a particular group. It's just a mathematical thing. And, and so when Roosevelt and all these guys came in and had these high taxes, it then forced people to say, well, since I am going to have to give all that money back as taxes, I'm going to invest to make this company better. I'm going to invest in the wages. I'm, and, and all those things started to grow as Richard Wolff would show and explain, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But then, but then... You know, with Reagan coming in and deregulating everything and cutting everything else. Well, you know, anyway, Howard, well, I have a go ahead. I'm sorry. The deregulation started under Carter. Yes. He's the yes. one who deregulated the trucking industry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think he was forced into doing that. I don't think he really wanted to do it. Right. And sometimes presidents are forced into doing things they don't want to do. Yes. But they started deregulation under Carter. Then right. by the 90s, they deregulated the communications business. That's why we only have a handful of companies that own all the radio stations, yes. with the exception of this one, of course. Yes. But still yes. in all, you can't have that because this is what you're going to end up with. A lot of poor people and a lot of rich people and nobody in between. Absolutely. Now, here's a deal. I got a, a fairly... 20 minute or 20 something minute um, interview with uh, Norman Norman Solomon. I was talking to um, uh, I think Van Viver a few uh, on Saturday that I was getting get, I had to get out of there to do this interview. This is a solid interview. Uh, you we got off to talking some very important issues. So some of the stuff that I start the show with I'm not going to be able to talk because I need to get with this. But beforehand I want to remind you guys that after the interview 713-526-5738 is the number to call and you guys know how to reach us. Go to uh, 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 kpft.org uh, if you want to stream 90.1 FM on radio. Go to politicsonright.tv if you want to watch it or go to uh, go to <laughs> facebook.com slash kpft Houston if you want to watch it as well. So um, the, the, the one other important thing, if you need to tell me something, if you want to tell me something, if you want to complain or you want to give kudos, whatever you want to do, send me an email at kpft at politicsunright.com. kpft at politicsdoneright.com. And please do not forget, this is your radio show. Always remember that. You are the ones who run stuff here. Anyway, I'm going to skip the first video because we kind of extended time with our preamble here. But here's what I'd like you guys to do. Uh, the newsletter is at politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. All the videos that we're going to show, including this interview, is also the links are also in that newsletter for you to get to. But without further ado, we're going to go ahead and play Norman Solomon with this excellent book that he just came out with that we better heed. Check it out. Take it on the other side. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Norman Solomon is an American journalist and activist, a media critic and the co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. Uh, He's the author of War Made Easy and is a longtime associate of Fear, Fairness, and Accuracy in Reporting. His new book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, is a must-read. Every single person that has read this book thus far finds it a must read, especially in these militaristic times that we are here in the United States of America. Welcome to Politics Done Right, Norman Solomon. Thanks so much. Look, it's my pleasure to have you as usual. You know, there's one part of uh, uh, where, where you mentioned when you give the indication that people are some people seem to be expendable. I'm originally from Central America, Panama, and I remember I remember when uh, Bush number one invaded Panama. And uh, when I think it was Colin Powell, they asked about 
the number of Panamanians that got killed. And the statement, I think it was out of his mouth or one of his protégés' mouth, was collateral damage. And just when I read the title of your book, that is the first thing that came to mind, people as collateral damage. Why did you write this book? I wrote it really much because of the point that you're raising here, that in the U.S. media and politics, whether it's acknowledged directly or not, some people are expendable and some people aren't. And a couple of years after that invasion of Panama, when the United States killed, according to the Pentagon, about 100,000 Iraqi people in six weeks, Time magazine gave a definition of collateral damage. According to this magazine, which was the main news magazine of the United States, collateral damage referred to people who should have chosen, and I'm quoting here, should have chosen a different neighborhood. Now, this is the kind of arrogance that we're dealing with. And in the 1980s, we had the effort of the United States of America from the White House to overcome what it often described out of the Oval Office as something bad that had taken place. It was called the Vietnam Syndrome because according to the, the military authorities and the presidents, this was a bad thing. People after the Vietnam War in the United States, some of them, many were very hesitant or even opposed to the U.S. intervening. So during the 80s, we had, of course, the invasion of Grenada, then the invasion of Panama, and that was a run-up. This was, okay, we're getting back into it, so we will crush these two small countries, and then we'll go on have bigger fish to fry in terms of militarism. So the Gulf War in 1991, then the U.S.-led bombing of Serbia and Kosovo in 1999, 78 straight days of bombing, not a single American lost, which is another way that good U.S. wars are defined. And then after 9-11, going ahead to invade Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I wrote this book to bring up to the surface something that is so routinely evaded many points on this spectrum that are not addressed. One is that the United States media and politics, with rare exceptions, tacitly or explicitly divides the planet into two parts, those who count and those who don't, those who suffer whose grief matters and those whose grief does not matter. And not coincidentally, the people whose grief does not matter according to US media and dominant politics are people whose suffering is caused by the US military. It is hard to believe. I noticed uh, the first chapter of your book, uh, you called it repetition and omission. Explain that. I mean, it, 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 repetition and omission, we do it all over and over again. And, and what are we omitting here? What are we missing here? Yes, in terms of U.S. military invention, intervention, you could say it's sort of a repetition compulsion disorder. <laughs> in terms of propaganda messaging, yes. we really know. I mean, how many times, if you watch a lot of TV, do you see a McDonald's commercial? You don't see it once, you don't see it twice. You see it so often. That's because it's well understood that in advertising, in propaganda, propaganda requires repetition. Repeating is the essence of propaganda. And when we talk about the bias, the extreme pro-military bias in favor of what Martin Luther King Jr. called the madness of militarism, once in a while, somebody will say, oh, but I read a news article that said something very different. I read a commentary. I heard one somewhere on a radio network, a commercial one. And it did bring up these points that you say are not being brought up sufficiently at all. And my answer to that is, because the essence of propaganda is repetition, the exceptions are, they're exceptional. That does not disrupt the dominant propaganda model. And what we're dealing with now, here we are the middle of 2023, and it has been so normalized. Healthcare, education, housing, neonatal care, elderly care in the United States, let alone many other countries, lacking basic support. People are dying behind this inequity. And yet, 
we're told that the Pentagon budget needs to keep rising through the roof. You know, Biden recommended last year he wanted a budget of 800 and something billion dollars just for the Pentagon. That wasn't enough for the bipartisan chairs of the House Armed Services Committees. Even more than that was appropriate. Now, it's interesting because you talk about we talk about repetition and the way that the media gets involved in it. Um, I want to ask a, a rather sinister question. Is the media generally supportive uh, or, or the way they interpret these military actions from the United States as benevolent because they get uh, a profit from all these advertisers that we have on TV? Again, you see a lot of Lockheed commercials, Martin Marietta commercials and all these others on these stations. Do they are they sort of feeding, uh, not wanting to bite the hands that feed them in effect? It's really multifactorial, and that's definitely one of the factors where you have significant numbers of dollars flowing into major and smaller media outlets, advertising from the U.S. military, from military contractors, and so forth. So that's one of the ways in which there's an incentive and a pressure to go along and get along with the militarism of the society. And we have the political pressure or we have other kinds of commercial pressure. You have ownership with interlocking directorates, people who are on the board of a major uh, military contractor, which includes Silicon Valley, by the way. And they're also on the board of a major TV network or a huge uh, news outlet of some sort. So that, again, is a pressure. And then you have the revolving door that goes around and around between Capitol Hill, the White House, and these military contractors. As a matter of fact, Antony Blinken, uh, he took four years out from government service uh, during the Trump administration, since he's a Democrat, and he made a lot of money uh, brokering military sales to the Pentagon. And so then he had to uh, set aside some of his uh, investments in a blind trust and so forth when he came back into the uh, Biden administration as it, uh, as it took shape. So this is very structural. And in terms of domestic policies, and I know in politics done right, you cover this extensively, a big difference between Democrats and Republicans on health care, on education, on civil liberties, on democracy. Of course, we want Democrats to be much stronger uh, for human rights on these issues, often falling short. But let's face it, the Republicans are neo-fascists in mm -hmm. Congress. So that's a big difference in domestic policies. However, once you get to what's been referred to often as beyond the water's edge, it becomes a unity, you might say, an imperial unity, where it's very hard. You know, once you get away from an issue, say, like on climate change, uh, global warming, where there is a difference, but in terms of military expenditures and intervention, Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill it's more like that. They're two peas in a militaristic pot. Let me ask you something about that, Norm, because that is something that we see that, I mean, it's very, very obvious. But is the driving force really that they're together or is the driving force that one party is scared to appear weak and thus they jump on the same bandwagon? Which, which one is it? Well, I think it is a combination. There's a shared belief in that the United States is the gift to the world, the extraordinary nation, as it's often called, the indispensable nation. There's a lot of pressure and belief, whatever the internal belief is, and I, I believe it's probably mostly uh, internalized. Democrats and Republicans, they believe that's their role. But uh, there also is that fear you're referring to. And when I was growing up during the escalation of the Vietnam War, one thing that Democrats did not want to be called is soft on communism. Mm -hmm. And then right after 9-11, and for years, Democrats were Republicans, but Democrats felt more defensive about this. They didn't want to be called soft on terrorism. And so that really is another club held over the head of uh, members of Congress, some of whom are very much inclined to want to push back against the militarism. And yet there's a lot of self-restraint that therefore, frankly, often amounts to political cowardice. You know, it's interesting because, I, and, I, and I think one of the reasons 
books like yours, and not only this book, but all the other books that you put out, informative and so important is that I think a lot of times uh, the ignorance of the American populace is what uh, the, these plutocrats depend on. And then, of course, they puppeteer their the politicians to do do their will. But as an example, we, we, we talk about America needs to get uh, tough on China. America needs to get tough on India. How could America possibly get tough? What can America really do if these guys ever just say, no, is military really the answer? Is military just a crap out? Well, there's really almost a nostalgia, which is being outdistanced by the economic realities of the world on Capitol Hill, a nostalgia for a unipolar world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember uh, the, the standard bumper sticker often uh, was red, white, and blue flag on the sticker. And next it would say, these colors don't run. And that's an attitude that we run the world. And of course, the counter bumper sticker also had uh, an American flag, red, white, and blue, and said, these colors don't run the world. But that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the aspiration is still there. And when you step back and you realize that 96% of the human beings on this planet do not live in the United States of America. You see the arrogance involved of empire, not empire building, because the empire of the U.S. has been around for many, many decades, but an effort to retain the empire. And I think part of that explains why the extreme, extreme bias on Capitol Hill and U.S. corporate media and so forth, that does, so to speak, tint the window on the world red, white, and blue. And it then has this, what I call in the book, or made invisible, two tiers of grief. The grief that is part of human experience, and in war, the grief that Americans have suffered or American allies, then that tier of grief is honored as it should be. But the tier of grief, say, of people in Afghanistan or Libya or Iraq who have died because of U.S. military firepower, uh, that tier of grief is, is so discounted that it is tacitly or explicitly through omission or commission of media coverage and political discourse just considered to be incidental or regrettable, but no big deal. Well, that is nationalistic to an extreme. It is often racist, and it's often so culturally centered on our particular way that we happen to live in the United States. I have a chapter in the book called The Color of War. I saw that, and yes. When I stepped back and I thought about it, I was working on this book, often in this room, thinking about it, trying to do more reading and interviewing, and it dawned on me that in two decades of the so-called war on terror after 9-11, virtually 100% of those killed by the U.S. military have been people of color. Now, that's hidden in plain sight. Where do we see that even discussed in our U.S. mass media, in the politics? It is like a no-go zone. It's right there. It's like the parable of the emperor's new clothes, that story. Who's going to say it? Who's going to say that out loud so that we can all talk about it? And to be very clear, in my book, and this is part of why I called it War Main Invisible, I say very explicitly that we need to understand how this is hidden from us. And yet it's happening. It's right in front of us. So I want to be very explicit about this. The United States government does not bomb countries because people of color live there. But because people of color live there, that makes it politically easier in the United States to have that warfare begin and continue. And what is stunning to me is that we, and this is a good thing, in the last several years, particularly after the Minneapolis police officer murdered George Floyd. We have had more discussion, not enough, but more discussion about structural racism, about systemic racism. But once you get beyond domestic realities, domestic politics and policies, we don't see any discussion 
of systemic racism in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. warfare. You know, uh, to DeSantis, DeSantis doesn't realize that we have yet to be woke enough. You know, he's concerned yeah. about the woke. Well, put. like we are not near as woke as we really need to be in knowing these particular issues. That's very true and very well put. I, I, I haven't heard it put quite that way before. That should become a national way of discussing what is wrong with these neo-fascists and DeSantis now leading the pack in many ways. It's an attitude that says that we should all go back to sleep. We should all be anesthetized. We should all be numbed when we should all be very callous. It is so inherently a vicious view of how humanity should treat itself. I don't know if you remember during Desert Storm, the way CNN covered it, it looked like a it looked like a a game on TV with lights and it, to, to put it bluntly, it was actually as as you saw it, it was actually pretty as you saw the lights and the flares. And I remember talking to somebody and saying, for every flare that you see, think about the number of people that are dead, the buildings that are falling and breaking skulls, etc. We in the United States, our media, uh, we're not allowed to see the carnage. But in Panama, in Costa Rica, in Dominican Republic, etc., their media actually saw the bones and the, the, the spilled blood and the cracked heads open. We couldn't see that here. So to us, it was a it was a game that was being played. And most of the wars, it, it's amazing in the chapter where, where you talk about the color of war. It's amazing the concern that we had for those in Ukraine and how badly, how cruel it was when in the Sudan and in many other places, atrocities of that nature, atrocities with our equipment being done. And it's nothing. It's very much a normalized uh, bias that is so extreme that it fits into what people seem to believe quite often is just just natural. It's I use that cliche, but it's perhaps appropriate. The fish in the water who says, what water? This is the right. baseline 24-7, 365 right. in the media. If we had news media in this country that was truly willing and able to function without fear or favor, then as you refer to, yes, we would have this empathetic coverage of people who are suffering because of this horrible uh, Russian invasion and war on Ukraine. We would also have similar coverage and empathy for people around the world suffering from warfare and especially difficult for any major media outlet to wrap its uh, uh, journalistic mind around is that people who are being killed, and this is still going on, by the way, as my book documents, under the, quote, war on terror subsidized by U.S. taxpayers, those people, if their suffering were being covered with anywhere near the kind of empathy uh, that we're getting for people in Ukraine, in U.S. media, it would cause a tremendous difference in the political atmosphere of this country. Amazing. Now, um, Norman, what would you like? First of all, uh, for those that are listening, these are the types of books that we need to get out there. More of us need to be reading these types of books because we're being we're being anesthetized by the mainstream media. That's what's really occurring here. So uh, I, I will urge folks to go out and get Actually, not only this particular book, War Made Easy, uh, War Made Invisible, but also War Made Easy. Remember, we spoke about War Made Easy as well. B those books should be bought combined. I mean, this new one, of course, but combined. Very important. What do you hope? And I don't like to use the word hope. Yeah. So I'm going to change that. What do you want to occur uh, from those reading your books? and those talking about your books? What I want for response to the book is very much related to what you just uh, referred to, Egberto, which is that the anesthetic, the anesthetized atmosphere of our society in the United States needs to have a big jolt that sustains us being awake constantly. We've got to be woke. We've got to be waking ourselves up and keeping ourselves awake 
Because this stuff is being done in our names with our tax dollars, and what goes around comes around. As uh, Martin Luther King III said a few years into the war on so-called war on terrorism, and I quote this in his book, he said, we all need to be concerned about terrorism, but you don't stop terrorism by terrorizing other people. And that's really a key message of this book. And as you referred to, I had an earlier one called War Made Easy. And when I thought about writing this new one, it really dawned on me that we have had so much warfare from the U.S. in this country, and more and more it has become invisible. And that's Mm -hmm. why the first three words of the new book I wrote is War Made Invisible, because when we can't see it, this warfare state has more and more power over us. So it's really about getting some acuity, sharing with each other, because underneath all that, the knowledge is key, and then organizing behind the knowledge for change is absolutely crucial. I know your books can be gotten everywhere, Amazon, everywhere else, but uh, where's your website that uh, folks can not only get your books, but get the commentary and a lot of your your, your knowledge from? I have an ongoing website, which is normansolomon.com, N-O-R-M-A-N-S-O-L-O-M-O-N.com. And also for this book, there's a lot of background about it uh, on the New Press website. And the New Press is a nonprofit publisher. And if you simply go to the newpress.com uh, and click on the icon with my book cover on it, I was really thrilled to get the kind of uh, endorsement and support for this specific book, or made invisible by Noam Chomsky, by activists, by those who have really been in the forefront of organizing. And as you know, and we've talked about this before, but I, I never feel that it's uh, too much to repeat. This is about learning and action, because the future of our lives and our loved ones really hang in the balance. The name of the book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, a must-get. Norman Solomon, American journalist, activist, media critic, and the co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. Thank you so kindly for having been once again on Politics Done Right. Thanks so much. I really appreciate our conversation. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, that is, well, I shouldn't say enjoy that. I mean, it was something about war. But um, uh, uh, I'm sorry for the initial uh, hiccup, but we we got through it. That 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 started, I'm going to blame Jack for that because Jack got me all hyped up about this other issue and I was supposed to push a particular button that I didn't. I'm only kidding. It's my yeah, complete yeah, fault. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. my fault. It's my fault. Hey, Howard, what's up? You know, I'm a new guy. A, a poor workman always blames his tools. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are in this together, man. You 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 know I'm a collective kind of guy. Now stop it, man. You, you're hurting you're, my feelings. <laughs> you're a good man too. You're a good man. Hey, but anyway, you- I hope you guys enjoyed um, uh, Solomon. I mean. Um, Norman Solomon, that's a, that book just came out recently. And I mean, uh, there are some, it was interesting because I'm from Central America, Panama. And I remember when we got invaded, when Bush uh, one invaded us. And, you know, um, there were, according to, if you go to the, the, the annals of the United States government, a thousand Panamanians died. I think something like 80 soldiers from America or somewhere that, around that, that amount died. But according to Wikipedia and other UN uh, stuff, like 4,000 died. But we know where... Um, Marañón is uh, the place where the, where the the, the the stealth fighter was out there. Think about it. We don't even have an army, so they were testing all this military equipment out there. We know over ten thousand Panamanians died, right? Nobody's going to talk about that. But but brother, we were called then collateral damage. That is a hurtful thing when you look at all the humans and just say, well, you know, we wanted to get Noriega, who was financing the sale of drugs. He was a great capitalist. Noriega, Manuel Antonio Noriega, everybody talks about the Panamanian dictator. I always call him the Panamanian capitalist because, you know, America, we wanted our drugs. We wanted to have our drugs flowing in. And what happened? He provided the service. 
And when he was no longer any use to the CIA, and when he decided he didn't want to go into, I think it was Nicaragua then with the Sandinistas, he said, oh, well, we don't need him anymore. We'll blow stuff up and then process 10,000 Panamanians, collateral damage. Johnny is in the house. Come on in, Johnny. Hey, uh, your tools did a pretty good job this morning, I would say. He pointed out the Sherman Antitrust Act and the, and the previous Gilded Age. Not bad for an ignorant tool, huh? No, you know, Howard was joking, man. We, we are a team. He, always, all, he, he knows that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm joking, too. Good. I'm, uh, I'm still having a diagonal day. Here's, here's another reason for that. Um, because Howard pointed this out, it's a, a gentle reminder. I would add that I'm asking myself, well, what are the history, high school and grade school history textbooks looking like right now? I'd like for teachers who listen to KPFT could tell us what these textbooks are shown in terms of the antitrust act and the end of guilty age. Do they go, do they discuss that in length or is that just glossed over or is it just not mentioned? Because when you think about it, those who want to rewrite history and ban libraries don't want to examine our real history, black history in this country. It would make logical sense by extension that they don't teach kids about how capitalism overall works, not just briefly, but also in the workplace, how people are being uh, beat down literally and figuratively. So, yeah, Howard's right. We're seeing this again. And in order for that to happen, school textbooks can't be going into this too deeply. I'd like to hear from teachers about this. Or do you have any specific knowledge about textbooks in Texas or California or New York? about the misinformation that kids are being fed with regards to history. And by the way, when I was growing grown up in the 60s and 70s, I had lots of questions back then that I was not satisfied about. So I can't even begin to imagine what maybe uh, a 17-year-old right now would be feeling back when he was 13 years old. That's why we need to have uh, your volunteer son on the air and his friends to have these discussions with us. We need to get together and start talking about this stuff. You know, Johnny, you uh, you are so right about that. You know, Howard spoke about the Gilded Ages, but the other thing about it is, um, what I try when I'm saying when I'm telling folks that we all have to get together, irrespective. You know, I mean, I, I you brought up race. I always talk about race. Be you know, unfortunately, we were made to believe in our indoctrination over the dec over the centuries. We were made to believe that the race thing was the real issue. The race thing has never, and you know, uh, a, a lot, a lot of black folks might, uh, you know, would, would would get mad when I when I say things like this, right? Uh, but I, you know, as an engineer, I believe in going to the underlying issue, right? The underlying issue is that something like race is stupid, right? There has to be a purpose. And you nailed it when you talk about what are the kids learning in school. They, they will refuse to teach them about the draconian nature of any particular economic system. Because again, when people understand how our economic system works at the core, the mathematical formula that governs it, again, and, and I say this, and I would, I would, I would, I would discuss, look, I am no genius. But I would discuss this with the, the I, with 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 Milton Friedman, our second god of capitalism, if he were oh, here. I and that. don't mention his name. Don't get me started on him. Right, but what I'm saying, I would discuss this because you know, the the, the funny thing about it, and uh, 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 is this, an economic system is not at all difficult. It's only created so we could trade services and products. It had there had to be something known as an abstraction layer, so that if I don't have all if I don't have all the things that you want right now, I still need to be able to get the things that I need. And an economic system presents the the, the tools so that we can exchange things over time. If I don't have stuff today to trade with you, I can. you can store something for the future. I mean, that's what it's for. The complexity in our economic system is the thievery, right? That, that you have to create structures that we can 
we would call it unampong. We can actually take something away from others without them quite realizing it, etc. That is a genesis of any economic system that's like ours. And explaining it to folks is difficult because we're so indoctrinated, right? And then we, we create all these other things for us to be scared about that when somebody like you or me or Howard or anybody or Jack, Jack start to question and ask or, or promote or teach certain things, they try to make us look like we're crazy when the numbers are all there to prove that we know what we're talking about. Johnny, give me a closer before I go to my next topic. Or worse yet, not so much crazy, but unpatriotic, antisocial. And by the <laughs> and, and uh, there was one other thought there. Now it took my mind. I hate when I do that. <laughs> That's all right. Listen, you can remember this is open calls, man. You can always call back. Let me get to the other um, to the other video, and then you know we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Alberto, I just remembered race. You mentioned race. Race yes. is using the tool. It's it's really not about race. You're right. It's really about economic disparity. But you use race as a tool because it's easy to identify people who look different than everybody else, especially when you bring them over against their will, and then you get the other people afraid of them and hating them. Yeah. That's all in the service of unfettered, underregulated, uh, mercenary-style capitalism. Yeah, let me tell you, B- Bernie Sanders, and this, this is something that upset me so badly. Bernie Sanders was accused of ha- being race-blind, not seeing that certain things were si- racially systemic. And, you know, a lot of things are racially systemic. That is true. But the truth of the matter is why I don't look at it being racially systemic. I'm asking the question, why is it that way? And when Bernie Sanders talk about uh, being the econ- uh, an economic thing, the man was absolutely right. And unfortunately, the, the thing and the angering thing is that it wasn't the Republicans who did these attacks. It was the centrist Democrat. Exactly. Exactly. Johnny, the problem is deep. But anyway, Johnny, let me, I, I don't have a lot of time left, and I really want to play this video about a, 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 a mainstream reporter doing the right things. But anyway, we talk, all right? Okay, lubricate your tools so they don't get rusty. <laughs> all right, folks, I want you to listen to this one, and then we'll take it on the other side. I don't think I'm going to screw this one up like I did the other one. So let's go ahead and get it started right this minute. Governor Chris Christie continues his assault on the one and only Donald Trump. Donald Trump is out there saying that the reason they're trying to get expunged the impeachment of Donald Trump. Uh, They want Donald Trump to be be, and, and, and to do so. You had McCarthy lying to a reporter who caught him red handed and 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 pointed it out immediately the only sad thing about it is as this reporter challenged him i saw all the other reporting sycophants around not really saying yes the reporter is right why are you lying to the american people let's check that out and you're gonna uh, they will take it on the other side uh, talk among Republicans about expunging Donald Trump's impeachment. What can you tell us about that and what has Kevin McCarthy said about it? Yeah, this is interesting. This is an idea that came from Elise Stefanik. It's been embraced by some of the kind of more MAGA members of the Republican conference, including Marjorie Taylor Greene. The idea would be basically passing a resolution to, they say, expunge uh, these two impeachments of Donald Trump. Uh, through some great research by our in-house historian, Kyle Stewart, our view on this on the NBC Hill team is that this isn't really a thing. It's the idea here is basically a non-binding resolution saying this thing that happened didn't happen. And you can't functionally remove an impeachment that was voted on, that went to a trial, uh, that was done. Although it does seem like this idea is gaining some support nonetheless. Uh, Kevin McCarthy was asked about it a little while ago. We got down quite a rabbit hole going back and forth on whether he would support this idea. Here's some of what he said to my colleagues and I. Now we find out with Durham and the others that um, the impeachment never should happen. We find when in Durham what way does Durham indicate the impeachment shouldn't have happened? Exactly, exactly what he said. He said they shouldn't have gone forward with it based upon the information that they had because the information wasn't true. You, was you, you wasn't impeached on anything related to Durham. He was impeached on the Ukraine and he was impeached on January 6th. It's nothing to do with Durham. Now, 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 now,
We went a couple rounds on this, Katie. The upshot here is that the Speaker of City he supports this idea in theory, but it doesn't sound like it's the kind of thing he's going to rush to the floor. He suggested it would go through committee and that our priorities were out of whack in the press corps for asking about this. As I pointed out to him, there is nothing in the Durham report or in his five hours of testimony from earlier this week that suggests Donald Trump should not have been impeached either on the Ukraine matter or certainly on January 6th, both of which he was impeached by the House of Representatives. Now, here's the deal. Garrett Hake, Garrett Hake, a Texan. Good job. I want to commend. Look, there are times that these reporters just say he said so, she said so. What Garrett Hake did there is extraordinarily important. He challenged the lie. He challenged the lie in real time as it occurred. Too many reporters are just saying, just in front of the, the politician, allow him to expunge the lie, put out the lie, and then they'll go into the studio and say, yeah, he said that, but in reality, you know what really happened? Well, no. Garrett Haig, at that point, at that moment, did the right thing as he went ahead and he pointed out, no, sir, you are lying. You are a liar. That is not what... That is not what the special counsel uh, said at all. Durham didn't say that. Durham, in fact, what he was covering had nothing to do with the impeachment. Donald Trump was impeached for being an insurrectionist on January 6th. January was in, in impeached for attempting to bribe a foreign governor, a, a foreign leader, in order to get the supplies, the, the military supplies that had already been given to him by the United States Congress. Let's get that right. Do not allow them to conflate these things. And kudos to Mr. Hake. Kudos. I really want to, him to get these kudos because that is what we need them doing. And, you know, the, the, what is important, folks, and, you know, people, and I say, well, well that's, uh, why are you getting excited over that little thing that he corrected the speaker? What happens the way, if you, if you watch the Sunday show, if you watch all of these things, what you'd find Republican politicians doing all of the times is they will stick in a little, a, a little lie that then other networks and other bloggers and others jump onto. And right now with this, with, with, uh, uh, Bo Breer and, and, uh, RGB, well, that's not RG, you know, you know I'm talking, uh, Taylor Green trying to get the, the impeachment somehow expound, even though you really can't do that, but they want it for the, for the, theatrics even they though they're trying they're trying to make it seem as if the reason we're doing this is even the special counsel said that donald trump should not be impeached and believe it or not the mainstream media would have taken that snippet and because they would have said it many times they would have run with it they would have run and said, you know, the, the, the special counsel said that uh, he, the Trump should not have been impeached. So these ladies are acting on it. That is how it works. Do you doubt me? Remember what they did with, with uh, uh, show me your birth papers, Obama. Like I mentioned before, if, if the first time that Trump had brought up, and I, I, I'm going to repeat this for all those who are first tuning into this show today. If, if when, when that issue about the birtherism started, where Trump questioned Don, uh, Obama's birth, birth certificate or his national, national uh, his citizenship, if immediately the mainstream media would have said it didn't matter if Obama was born in Angola, it didn't more matter if Obama was born in Kenya, it wouldn't have mattered if Obama was born in Thailand because his mother was an American citizen, a born American citizen that made Obama, wh whoever his father was, who were, whatever land he was born on, it made him a natural born American citizen who qualified to be president. That should have ended the discussion right there. But because the Republican politicians brought that Bertha thing up and the media bought it immediately, they ill-informed the American people, and in so doing, 
it created the birther issue. The big lie was the birther issue that should never have been the birther issue, given that the president's mother was an American citizen. And that is how uh, that is why I was so excited about hate stopping this lie at its inception. Because that is what has to be done. Anyway, folks, we are having, uh, you know, I didn't get across to all the subjects that I write for. You know, I write these programs assuming that there are zero calls or there's zero interactions in case, you know, we have that. But we always have great talk with the great guys in the studio. We always have great talk with the great callers that are calling in. And the listeners, we know that you're out there. We thank you so kindly for listening Every single morning, what we need you to do is let other people know that we have a program where you own, where you can be a part of, where if you have commentary, you can find us and talk to us. Don't forget to send an email to kpft at politicsdoneright.com, kpft at politicsdoneright.com. If you want to complain about the program, if you want to tell us something nice about the program, if you want to tell us something you want covered on the program, we are here for exactly that. This is real community radio. You are genuinely in charge. And I tell you, Jack, both Jack and Howard would tell you that as well. So folks, please remember to, uh, by the way, before I, 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 I throw this to Howard, um, please remember that I didn't cover all the subjects that I wrote for. So just go to politicsunright.com slash newsletter, and you can see and l- the link to the v- entire video, including the little mishaps that we had. All the good stuff is going to be there for you to uh, get at your leisure. Anyway, back to Howard. What's up, buddy? Well, I think we had a pretty good show today, Egberto. Uh, a lot of topics covered. Maybe not all of the ones you wanted to cover, but we did cover a lot of topics. And Jack, you got any closing thoughts here this morning? No, I, I really, I just want that that idea of what is dissent, you know, and the political process for people to keep that in their mind. You know, the rights of people to say, no, we don't like what's going on. Well, Amen. that's when you vote. Yes. That's when you get out and vote. Yes. And don't make me get on my soapbox the last 30 seconds here. You see, now Howard going to take the 30 seconds and get on his darn soap. No, actually, uh, that is I'm a very important. So- it's an important soapbox that I love to hear every single time, but I got to get out of here. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics on Right. I want to thank Jack Van Beber and Howard Reynolds. I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.